Welcome back to another episode of A Very British Space Programme. It is the 12th of June 1965 and Sirius week or month is, is continuing. So we have the Messenger 12 carrying out its departure burn. And if you want to see more, please uh, join me. So Messenger 12 is actually uh, repositioning or, or positioning itself after that departure burn so that it can actually uh, use the remainder of the uh, ITS, the Intermediate Transfer Stages fuel, to refine its path to Sirius. Now it's used its uh, its engines on the ITS, its main engines on the ITS, to actually carry out the, the main burn. It's actually a, an energetic burn. But the next step is actually going to be using the RCS, which uses HTP that's already in the tanks, to actually uh, refine that a little bit. And uh, this becomes a very long burn. There's one of the big issues with the uh, the transfer to series that we're seeing is that actually there is um, our burns to it has not been particularly good. So it, it is going to carry out quite a long burn there. I'm just going to show you a part of it. And you can see it's very much an inclination change. It's a slight radial um, out, I believe, and a slight inclination and a little bit of, of prograde as well, just to give it a little push. But there is actually quite a lot of delta V required for that. So it's gonna, it's gonna take a little bit of time for it to do that. Meanwhile, on the 14th of June, 1965, Sparrow 2 um, is carrying out maneuvers to bring it into path with Ceres. And unfortunately, while we were calculating the burn, it became clear that uh, Sparrow, Sparrow Hawk 2 uh, does not have enough fuel to capture around Ceres. If we actually do the burn uh, the way we want, uh, it's it's not going to have enough fuel after using the uh, the RCS to actually do it. So a decision is made. Um, we're going to sacrifice the lander, which is is not what we hope. We're going to sacrifice the lander. We do have another one. Sparrowhawk one is en route. Um, Sparrowhawk two. We're going to lose the sparrow. So the, the lander uses, transfers or uses all of the fuel it can, all of its RCS, all of the power it's got to basically carry out as much of a maneuver change as it can. And then, uh, then we're going to basically dump it. We're going to get rid of it. So there we go. It's gone. The, uh, the, the orbiter will continue on. Um, the orbiter doesn't actually have any science on it or it doesn't have any additional science on it. It is pr pretty much a relay situation or a relay craft. Um, it's going to act as a relay around Ceres, but the decision is made that actually having having an orbiter around Ceres able to relay a signal from potentially other science equipment or from other landers will increase the, the possibility that future missions can be successful and it will actually allow us hopefully to remain to signal with uh, Sparrow 1 when it arrives and detaches from its orbiter. So there is a positive there. So. This is an exceedingly long burn. Um, it goes on and on, and you can see that we, we did burn sideways with the RCS slightly to take it away from the uh, the Sparrow over there, but the Hawk will continue on its own with its reduced mass. The, um, the craft should be able, hopefully, to actually get into orbit around Ceres. Now, it will be tight, but it should be able to get into a reasonable orbit. And you see that we're just refining the final parts of that. So. Um, also on the 14th of June, what you can see on screen now is uh, Messenger 12 is actually doing a little refinement there. It's just using uh, as much fuel as it can out of the ITS now before it gets rid of it. It's actually going to retain the uh, intermediate transfer stage until the series interface. It has the power on board at the moment to actually to power that. It, it has enough of the nuclear charge and whatnot to do that. Um, we're unsure as to whether it will be able to get into orbit though. Um, that's touch and go at the moment. And so we are trying to save as much Delta V as possible. Um, we may actually even use some of the RCS uh, on that on that ITS when we come near series just to try and even get as much out of the capture burn as possible because it is laden with science. And the longer it can say, stay in orbit of series or around series, the more we can get. Meanwhile, it is the 3rd of July, so it's, it's, it's been a couple of weeks now since the departures of all of Ceres month. Um, we're on to another sort of craft, and this is something entirely different for us. Well, this isn't. This is this is a, a Blue Knight uh, 2 here that's just going up. You've seen this before. It's got nine engines on the bottom. It does its long burn up there. Um, it's nothing new for you. 
but what is inside is a little different. This is part of something we're entitling the uh, the Enlightenment program, and it's billed as a mapping the world, enabling all the people of the planet to understand the planet we live on, the impact we're having upon it, and it's in no means a spy satellite at all. It is purely there, entirely there, nothing else but looking after the Earth and understanding the environment. It's not a spy satellite, no matter what anybody tells you. No, not at all. So this will be going into a uh, pretty much a, a polar orbit. We're launching from uh, Spade Adam. Spade Adam will be uh, basically the launch site for this now because Spade Adam is uh, not really going to be used heavily for crewed launches or in fact for station orbits. We have something else coming online uh, in the near future which is actually involved or linked with this, the uh, with the Enlightenment program. You can actually see at the back of the Enlightenment craft, this is an Enlightenment one, that propulsion system with the docking port, that is actually taken directly from um, something that we've been developing for launch from Australia. This is gonna be part of our, our next step in space, our next step to survive in space for extended periods of time. So that, that lower section there, behind the, the aft of the craft, or it's actually the fore of the craft. Now we've, we've spun around a little bit. There we go, you can see there. Um, those are actually uh, shared components that we're using. We're trying to do this a lot. We're trying to use a lot of shared on-orbit material. So, for example, our uh, endurance craft, they actually shared propulsion systems with uh, with the Maxwell craft and things like that and the design concepts with the, with other things and the, all that sort of stuff. So this is this is just uh, continuing that, that sort of reusability of, of design philosophy because while, we, while we're leading the space race at the moment, um, we don't have as much money as other people to throw at these things. You know, we're, we, the Commonwealth is helping, but it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not able to support us fully uh, in the way that we'd like. Um, so anyway, this is going to place itself into a polar orbit around about, uh, we're, we're aiming for around 600, 590 kilometers above the surface. Um, it also comes, and you can see there the four extra dishes sticking out there, are X-band dishes. These are our first on orbit x band dishes and uh, they will be uh, aimed primarily at um earth uh, they will be aimed at the moon and then at uh, other planetary bodies as we see fit and that'll just be there to basically uh, improve communications and uh, the speed of communications and the, uh, the availability of communications we don't have any long range x band communications going on at the moment so uh, other than a couple of probes that we've sent out that have had additional x band antennas on but uh, yeah this thing's pretty much just going to uh, augment our communication system as best we can particularly when it's up because it's in polar orbit over the poles and things like that it is laden with science of course and so we, we get that on there and we're uh, we're actually just gathering a vast amount of science now you can see the huge amount of data that's being spooled down to the earth through those x-band transmitters and we're just positioning the craft to get the, as much sunlight as possible onto those solar panels you can see this is probably one of our most heavily solar paneled craft that we've ever put up in fact it is significantly more solar panels than we've put up i think we've got yeah, eight eight sets of large panels on there some of the most advanced technology we've got this is the cutting edge of the uh, british space program right now it is it is just scooping up knowledge and and, and and testing new designs and it's wonderful we're loving it it's going to be the start of something very very big we think meanwhile about five days later it is the 8th of july 1965 and messenger 9 is arriving at mars you can see it's spinning quite wildly this is this is sped up obviously because if it was spinning that fast it would be a bit of a problem it is spinning slightly and uh, it does have the ability to uh, to orientate itself and things like that so we we can actually we can actually we'll just slow it down a bit there we can actually uh we can actually reorientate it as need be and there we go so we're just going to put its transmitter towards earth and the sun and so forth and and let it travel towards us and it does so it's going to be gathering lots of lovely science as it goes towards mars now of course this craft was the the budget bodge together craft that was basically uh, assembled from the remnants of the the troubled emissary one mission so the the original emissary two booster i think was actually repurposed for this and then we we basically took together a hesperus four and, and and operated it and i think this is the i think this was the first 
flight or one of the first flights of the uprated Hesperus 4Bs. So this is uh, this is nice for us. This actually lets us see how it's doing. It's got that larger antenna on the top there. It's got its uh, magnetometer boom all stuck out there getting all the science and it's coming in close to the south pole of Mars. And uh, this craft is basically going to be replacing Hesperus 1C and D. So the, the first generation of probes that actually uh, managed to capture around Mars. Our first Mars orbiters, they're going to be replaced there. They've been up there a while now. They're solar, I believe they were, yeah, they were solar powered. Their solar power panels have basically degraded. They're not really of any use to us anymore. Their, their scientific equipment has basically run its course. It's, it's not particularly efficient and we're not getting much from it. And this craft is, although it only departed five, what, four or five years later, it is so far ahead in technology it's actually unbelievable that the, the strides that we have taken with our with our development is unbelievable so this craft is uh, is going to quite easily put itself into orbit it's actually got an awful lot of fuel on board it's it's in many ways over overbuilt for this it's designed for arriving at, at much higher speeds to other planetary bodies um and it's not had to use any of this fuel at all really in its transfer it did some some minor course corrections but you can see there it's able to basically pull itself in and it's got a lot of fuel so it's going to be able to really play around with its orbit there and you get a beautiful little little pan there as it comes over the top there just slowly over the top of the, the the pole of mars the sun reflecting on it absolutely stunning and of course all these images we've got cameras on board all these images fired back to the UK, back to the Commonwealth countries, all the newspapers and everybody of course love because we've got now got colour, colour images, We're not just black and white dotty pictures anymore. Our, our image quality has improved dramatically. And so we've got nice stabilization on this craft. It's got the ability to orientate itself properly. Even this uh, even this sort of deceleration right now is controlled in a way that previously with the row engines it was you know one fire all go these things they're, they're using integrated systems. They use the same fuel as we're using for our RCS. They're as efficient, if not more efficient in many ways than the, the raw engines. It's just a much better craft for this sort of mission. And it, it, it's, it's starting to you know, impress. It's, it's significantly ahead of what the, the USSR and the USA have actually been able to, to put around here. However, we are potentially gonna take a step back from interplanetary sort of work at the moment we've got a lot of craft out there and we need to refocus our efforts we need to refocus on what we want to do mars is a possibility venus is a possibility but um we also have things close to home that we need to take care of you know the the, the british the commonwealth must expand the the empire i mean the commonwealth must expand we must uh, begin to spread and of course that means most likely we're going to be looking at the moon and things like that so we're going to be assessing that as time goes on so once we've got ourselves it capturing into orbit and this does take a little while uh, we're going to be doing the science already and we're going to go into a reasonably um a reasonably elliptical orbit a reason a reasonable orbit in just general we're not we're not binding tightly um at the moment we're gonna we're gonna sit in a polar orbit that's not cl really massively close to mars this this craft has the ability to act as a relay it has that directional antenna for communication back to earth so it will serve a number of different purposes there is a lot of science to be gathered around mars and, and this craft is here to scoop up as much as we can it is one of our most heavily science laden craft that we have and um, and it will basically just do all that it can you can see there even though all that technology is there though when we're behind mars we cannot see <laughs> we cannot communicate with this thing it has to run on its own and there we go our first images of the north pole of mars and what looks like ice which is quite interesting it's not something we've really thought too much about but that could potentially be ice and of course the the equipment on board this craft will help us understand if that is ice if there's something that we can actually do with it or if it's going to be of any use to us um mars looking very calm very beautiful right now very relaxed and so as we uh, come around mars this is actually the last mission of this uh, episode we're actually not going to be uh, we're going to do any more in this episode this is going to be it so um next episode we're, we're going to be launching some new things i think particularly in the next couple of episodes so 
as the sun begins to set on our probe around Mars, I'd like you to really think about what's the next steps for our space program. Do we do we push on for Mars? Do we do we push on for Venus? Do we you know push on with our plans for uh, human presence in low Earth orbit? Is there a reason for that, or are we just you know wasting our time? And, uh, and what about the Moon? What's the next step? So, what do you think should happen? From me, until next time, have a great one.